So I am currently holding a rock from outer space. <laughs> if you couldn't tell it, this is me geeking out. This is me geeking out. <laughs> so this rock actually comes from the asteroid belt. So the part of space between like Mars and Jupiter where a lot of asteroids come from. Compare that to this little sample over here, which is a Martian meteorite. I'm actually holding a piece of Mars right now. So this will have been created when another rock hit into the surface of Mars, throwing up a load of fragments. One of those fragments ended up falling to Earth. And you can get the same thing happening from the moon as well, so that you also get lunar meteorites. Now, unfortunately, the Oxford National History Museum, where I am at the minute, doesn't have any lunar meteorites. You know, sad times. But if you're wondering, well, how do we tell what's the difference between something that's come from the asteroid belt, something that's come from Mars, and something that's come from the moon, in part, it's all thanks to the moon rocks that were returned by the Apollo moon landings. Now, it's the 50th anniversary of the very first moon landing on Saturday, the 20th of July, 2019. And while that was one giant leap for mankind, I think it's the scientific legacy of the Apollo missions that really were their crowning glory. So the experiments that the astronauts did on the surface of the moon itself, and then all the experiments we did from the moon rocks and soil samples that were brought back to Earth after the missions that have really pushed the boundaries of humanity's knowledge of our place in the universe. So all the news stories you're gonna hear in the next week are gonna be about that incredible achievement of Apollo 11 being the first mission to put humans on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin taking those first steps while Michael Collins still pilots the command module in orbit around the moon. And yeah, that was an incredible achievement, but I really wanna talk about the science that was done off the back of the Apollo missions. So I've got five things for you that we didn't know before the moon landings. So Apollo 11, 14 and 15 all left laser retroreflectors on the surface of the moon so that we could fire a laser at the moon, it would bounce back to us, and then from the time it took, we'd be able to calculate the distance. Now people often refer to this as they left a mirror on the surface of the moon, but that's not quite right because the way a mirror reflects light is very different to how a retroreflector reflects light. Example. If I point this laser at an angle at this mirror, it looks like the laser's going straight through, but in reality what's happening is it's being reflected over the other side. It's reflected at the same angle as the angle I'm pointing at the mirror at. Not ideal for leaving something on the surface of the moon. Instead, to get a reflection back, I have to point it directly at it and apparently give myself a laser mustache in the process. If instead I point this laser at a retroreflector, a bike reflector, you'll see that whatever angle I point the laser at it, it always gives me a reflection back in the direction it came, and that is ideal for leaving on the moon. To put it into perspective though, of every 100 million billion photons in the lasers pointed at the retroreflectors left on the surface of the moon, only one makes it back to Earth. So this is really precision science here. So you'd never be able to see the laser coming back with the naked eye, unfortunately. But what it's allowed us to do is actually measure that the moon is moving away from us every single year by about 3.8 centimeters, which is intriguing to say the least. And this is all happening because of the tides, the difference in the force of gravity on the earth and the moon, which is causing sort of like a drag force, which is slowing down the rotation rate of the earth by about like two milliseconds a century or something. And then at the same time, causing the moon to move away from the earth. And so the rate that it's moving away from the earth and the distance that it currently is at kind of gives you an age on the moon if you sort of wind back time. It gives you an age though of about one and a half billion years, and yet the oldest rock we've ever found on the moon is over four billion years old. So we think that it's actually faster now than it was in the past, but we'll come back to that later. So for the two and a half hours or so that Neil and Buzz walked on the surface of the moon during the Apollo 11 mission, they placed a seismometer on the surface, i.e. a device that could detect seismic waves, i.e. moonquakes. The same as we have seismometers on Earth to detect earthquakes. And that was to enable us to figure out what the interior of the moon was actually like. And they did that by using seismometers that were placed by later Apollo missions in different locations on the moon's surface, which sort of joined together to make this network to pinpoint the distance and location inside the moon that these moonquakes were coming from. And you can do that because seismic waves travel deeper through the interior the further away they've come from. And so you essentially get a time delay on your network depending on which direction or how deep a moonquake 
has come from. Also, these waves get refracted when they move from liquid to solid as well. And so some of the first results from this experiment suggested that the moon's interior could actually be liquid and have this molten magma interior just like the Earth did, which wasn't really expected at all because the moon is a very static object. We've never really seen it change at all. And so it was thought to be a very solid lump of rock. Not only that, but the seismometer experiments revealed that the moon also had an iron core just like the Earth. However, the iron core in the moon was only about 25% of its radius compared with the Earth's iron core, which is about 54% of its radius. The Earth actually is the densest planet in the solar system because of that, because its iron core is so big. Again, this was a weird result that people didn't really know how to explain. So another experiment carried by Apollo 11 was the solar wind composition experiment. And you might have seen this in the background of a lot of the photos from the Apollo 11 mission and wondered what it was. It was called the Swiss flag and it was essentially a big sheet of aluminium foil that was left exposed to space to collect solar wind particles. So solar wind comes from the sun. It's extremely high energy particles that are released from the interior when the sun gets a little bit too active. Now on Earth, we're shielded by those high energy particles because of our magnetic field. Some of them do get funneled down to the poles and we get the beautiful aurora, the northern and the southern lights. But the moon doesn't have a magnetic field, so it's completely unprotected, which means we can get a really pure sample of the particles in the solar wind. Now it's really important we understand this because these geomagnetic storms can essentially create a huge shock wave on the magnetic field of Earth, which can put out electrical grids, communication networks, satellites, all of which can have an impact on day-to-day -day life here on Earth. So it's something we have to understand in order to be able to mitigate for. So while that experiment did allow us to better understand the solar wind, the other thing it allowed us to do was to measure the total density of all normal matter in the universe, which is a pretty big deal for a short backyard hop to the moon. And the reason they could do that was they were able to measure the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in the solar wind, i.e. in the sun itself. Now deuterium is something we call heavy hydrogen. In a normal hydrogen atom, you just have one proton in the center of the atom, but in deuterium, you also have a neutron as well. But there's no astrophysical process that we know can create deuterium. It's actually destroyed in stars in order to make helium. The only time we ever know that deuterium was actually produced was during the Big Bang. So that if you can measure the amount you find today in stars, you can put a lower limit on the amount that was actually created in the Big Bang. But that amount of deuterium is then directly correlated with all the normal matter you make in the Big Bang. So if you can measure the abundance of deuterium now, then you can infer the total density of all normal matter in the universe. And so the solar wind composition experiment of Apollo 11 gave a value for that of three times 10 to the minus 31 grams per centimeter cubed. Compare that with a more recent measurement of this from 2001, which used galaxies to probe it, we found four times 10 to the minus 31 grams per centimeter cubed. The agreement between the different methods is excellent. It's actually within 30% for all the known methods to measure this. And the solar wind composition experiment from Apollo 11 is one of them. So not just stuff about the moon Apollo 11, but stuff about the entire universe as well. The lasting legacy of the Apollo missions though is definitely the amount of moon rocks and lunar soil samples they brought back to Earth with them, 382 kilograms in total. And I cannot stress enough how valuable they are because they provide this window into like geological time where you've had no effects of weather or erosion like you do on Earth. So you can really probe the very early days of the solar system. The oldest rocks we've ever found on Earth are in the range 3.8 to about 4.2 billion years. But some of the rocks from the highlands found on the moon from some of the later missions have been dated at 4.4 billion years. Nearly every moon rock is older than nearly every Earth rock. The other big surprise was that most of the moon's surface was made of igneous rocks. These are rocks made of big crystalline structures that form when lava cools and solidifies, which tells us that the moon was once molten. So as well as carbon dating the rocks to get an age, you can also measure something called the oxygen isotope ratio. And an isotope is essentially a normal atom 
that you've added extra neutrons to the center of to make it a bit heavier. And that is often then unstable as well, so they'll radioactively decay eventually back into a normal oxygen atom. And when they measured the oxygen isotope ratio in moon rocks compared within earth rocks, they found they were exactly the same and completely different from any other rock in the solar system, an asteroid meteorite or a Mars meteorite. So there was a lot of people scratching their heads over this, but the final piece of the puzzle came from the Apollo 15 mission and the discovery of a mineral called olivine on the surface of the moon. This is olivine. It's a mineral made out of iron and magnesium, and you will notice that it is green. Now, this is not the first time that I've held olivine because it's also found on the surface of the earth as well and in particular in Hawaii. So I got to go to Hawaii as part of my PhD. I was sent to observe some galaxies using the telescopes on the top of the mountain there, Mauna Kea. And once I'd done all my night shifts and I got back down to sea level, I decided to go snorkeling. So in amongst all the turtles and the fishes, I got very excited when I spotted some green sand, just like this sample here sand essentially made of olivine. And the reason you find olivine in Hawaii like that is because essentially the entire Big Island of Hawaii is one huge giant volcano. And olivine is one of the most common minerals found in the Earth's magma ocean underneath its crust. So anywhere you've got a volcano or tectonic plates meeting, you can dredge up a lot of that olivine to the surface. But that's really the only time you ever see it. So you can imagine the Apollo 15 astronauts surprise when they're just casually driving their lunar rover and they spot a green rock in amongst all of the gray on the surface of the moon. So that really confirmed the moon did have a magma ocean just like the seismic experiments had been suggesting. And that was because olivine essentially is so much heavier than any of the igneous rock you get at the surface that it sinks to the bottom of that magma ocean. And so the purity of the olivine you then get at the surface is directly related to how deep your magma ocean is. And on the moon, we find the magma ocean is 600 miles deep which is essentially half of the moon's radius. To have a magma ocean that large, it means the moon has to have formed incredibly quickly and at one point been entirely molten rock. Now, the fact that you find both olivine on the surface of the Earth and the surface of the moon formed by the exact same processes suggests that the moon and the Earth actually have a common origin. So before the Apollo missions, there was a couple of theories floating around for how the moon might have formed. It could be that it was a captured asteroid, just like we saw in Phobos and Deimos, Mars's moons. Or it could be that the moon and the Earth had formed from the same material at the same time around the sun. And then there was a pretty old theory that said the moon could have formed after a huge impact of something with the Earth in the very early solar system. But people had sort of dismissed that theory for being, well, kind of too obvious, sort of too coincidental, a bit of a just-so story. But with all the findings of the Apollo mission, that the moon is slowly moving away from us, that it was once molten and now has a crust made of solidified lava, that it has a magma ocean still underneath that crust with an iron core that's much smaller than Earth's, the fact that it has the same oxygen isotope ratio as Earth and that we find olivine there, and even that the moon and Earth are spinning in the same direction and that the Earth has this massive tilt that causes our seasons. Every single one of those results piled up and up in favour of this giant impact hypothesis, first proposed by Reginald Aldworth Daly in 1946, and finally then revisited by Hartman and Davis in 75 and Cameron and Ward in 76. It would finally become the accepted front-running theory for how the moon had formed after a conference in 1984 in Kona in Hawaii, where the participants met to discuss what was the accepted theory now post-Apollo. And there's reports of people walking around shell-shocked because they couldn't quite believe that the giant impact hypothesis had come out on top. The general idea is that a Mars-sized planet that we call Thea collided with the very early Earth in the early days of the solar system. That liquefied the entire Earth and the entirety of Thea, threw out all of this molten rock into space, which was gradually brought back into orbit around Earth. That coalesced to form the Moon in a very short space of time, so less than a hundred years. Then it cooled and solidified, and ever since then it's been gradually moving away from us. 
So Apollo itself has an incredible scientific legacy, along with all the people that it inspired to do PhDs in engineering, physics, computer sciences. And it's those people that are now leading the missions where we send probes to elsewhere in the solar system as well. Now there's talk from many countries about sending people back to the moon. But one thing's for sure is that the Apollo landing sites should be preserved as culturally significant landmarks that shouldn't be disturbed and instead preserved for all future generations of space tourists to come. Now, if you want more historical and scientific background on how we figured out that the giant impact hypothesis was the leading theory for the formation of the moon, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's called The Big Splat. It's by Dana McKenzie, and it is the book that convinced me to be a scientist. I couldn't believe how incredible it was that the pieces of the puzzle would all come together from every single little person's contribution to the field. It was like reading sort of a murder mystery or a crime novel about how scientists uncovered the evidence and uncovered the truth. And I guess that's the biggest hope that I have for my book that comes out in September as well, is that someone one day will also say that it was the book that inspired them to be a scientist. Oh, did you all notice that I won an award as well? Oh, it was for my YouTube channel. It was the University of Oxford Vice Chancellor's Public Engagement with Research Awards, which I wouldn't have won if all of you weren't watching my videos. So this one's for all of you. Thank you so, so much. I am forever in your debt. And this cool star trophy that I got is amazing. I kind of want to make it into a necklace, but I think it would be a little bit excessive. So... Maybe I shouldn't. Speaking of necklaces, did you spot my uh, my Crescent Moon necklace, which I thought was very appropriate for this video? I'm absolutely obsessed with this necklace at the minute. It's from Pure Late. I'll link it down below. Absolutely gorgeous. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin taking their first steps on the moon while Michael... Michael. My name is Michael Collins. <laughs> You're getting on my wick, me. <laughs> this, this one's my favourite. So cool. I didn't hold it the other day. It's amazing. <laughs> we need to hoover the dinosaurs and it might interrupt filming. <clears throat> I just held a space rock. Ah!